Good evening, audience. I'm very happy to be here this afternoon to speak about the greatest person that ever lived on the earth, or ever will be on the earth, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why one day I was talking, and wife, one of the first meetings we was ever in, she says, all those people come, I said, the gospel is the greatest drawing card the world has ever had. I say, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And now, it falls my lot this afternoon to speak a little warm under the tent, and I'm not a preacher to begin with, but I, I like to talk on the Word. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing of the Word. That's what gives us faith. Before we can have faith, we must have a basis for faith. Isn't that right? Be, if you was going to get married, you'd have your wife would have to tell you she loved you and how she'd be true to you. You have a you have her word then. And then your faith, it just depends on how you feel about it. If her word is all right or not. That's what we have to do by any way, by faith, we have to have the a background, a foundation. And now we're going to just not keep you no longer than possible in speaking. As I said, I wasn't a preacher. I just love to talk on the Word. Uh, I once, when I was first ordained as a, a Baptist preacher, my, that was the, one of the greatest hours of my life. I, when I was a little boy, I thought it took a sissy to pack a Bible. But when I was saved and got ordained, I'd go down the street with my Bible under my arm, and my, when they would call me brother or something, I just all swelled out. I thought I was the real preacher. And they just had local exhorter license just for the state of Indiana that I could preach and marry or bury or baptize. So I thought I was a real preacher until one day I heard a real preacher and then I realized I wasn't any preacher. It reminds me when I was at home, my father used to break bronco horses. He was born in the state of Kentucky. My mother from Oklahoma and moved down into Texas, above Paris. And my dad went west uh, breaking horses, and he was a, quite a rider and a very fine uh, shot and uh, with a gun. And he went west breaking horses, and that's how he met my mother. So I always thought that I wanted to be a rider. I hear my dad talk about how he would uh, break the horses and skin the, you know, the team and so forth. And we lived on a farm, and I thought, oh my, when I get this a little bigger, I'm going to be a real rider. I've been to the picture show a few times and seen some of the movies, you know, or some of that on them dude ranches, and I thought, oh, I'll just be a real hero. So when I used to get the old uh, horse, I actually would plow with him all day, you know, and get him out behind the barn to the water and crawl. How many country boys is there in here? Let's see your hands. Now, don't be backward. Ah, so, all right. And we'd get out there for the old water and crawl, and I'd get me a handful of cuckaburs and put them under the saddle and pull down the hitches on it. I'd climb up in the middle of the old horse, you know, and my poor old thing's so tired. He, he just worked to death. And here I would sit there, and he couldn't get his feet off the ground. I'd just fall and turn around. I'd take my old straw hat and have my little brothers lined up down there, and I'd say, look at me as a cowboy. <laughs> just a beating that old horse in my hat, and the poor old thing, why, well, he, he couldn't have thrown an egg off his back, hardly. So I was up there in this saddle, you know, just a bucking away. I thought I was. And one day I thought I was a real rider, so I left home and went out west to be a cowboy. I landed in Arizona, and so I was at Phoenix, and I was just having a rodeo, and I thought, well, now here I'm broke, so I'll just get some money. It had to be a little later we check in the time. Brother Lindsay was just a little way from there at the same time preaching the gospel, and we didn't know that until recently when we checked our times when we were there. 
And they had a rodeo up there. It's a roundup. And they were talking about, all oh, how you go out and ride and there'd be prizes for riders. Well, I thought, I'll have to get me a pair of shacks, you know, before I go out there. I went down to one of the outfitting apartments, and I got a pretty pair. You know, it had great big A-R-I-Z-O-N-A on it and steer head, you know. I put them around me, and there's about that much leather laying out on the floor. I looked like one of these little bandy roosters with that, all that feathers hanging back. Well, people wasn't go to I know that wasn't nothing, so I finally come to find out the price of them. I didn't have the money, so I got me a pair of Levi's and went on out to the pen. They were, I climbed up on there with the rest of those old disfigured cowboys, you know, and the bull eggs and sitting up there, and they went through and called if they going to have a certain rider to ride a certain horse. I thought, oh my, I'll watch him. And I said, if he can't ride it, I will. So I, I never seen a rodeo before. And after a while, when he come out, I seen this fellow climb up in the chute, stand like his, and just catch his catch can. And when he come out, and mine, when he dropped on that horse, he made about two balls and looked like he had as one of those outlaws, you know, and you could put both feet in a wash pan and throw a saddle over the krill fence. So just as soon as that fellow hit on him like that, he made about three lunges like this and sunfish. And when he did that, the fellow went up in the air, twisting around, fell down, the pickups got the horse. The fellow come back to you, called and said, I'll give any man $50 who will stay on him one minute. $50. And he'd been looking all down along that fence. $50, who will take it? You come right straight to me and said, are you a rider? I said, no, sir. <laughs> well, I wasn't a rider. I thought I was then until that time. Well, then when I thought I was a preacher one time, I packed the Bible around, had a little paper in my pocket, and I thought I was a preacher. And one day I was in St. Louis, Missouri, and I run into a Pentecostal camp meeting. And there was a Pentecostal preacher there by the name of Darty. And my goodness, that man started preaching. He was just turned blue in the face and buckling his knees and go plump the floor. When he'd come up, he'd catch his breath. You could hear him two squares and still preaching. Some of walked up and said, you a preacher? I said, no, sir. <laughs> <laughs> my old slow Baptist ways don't think of it that fast, that's all. So I just have to come here take my time. So around where these real preachers, I never say I'm a preacher, so I kind of keep covered up with that. <laughs> so, but I do like to get out when you're not under that anointing for the sick, you know, and you can just get liberty, you feel free to preach or to speak of the word or anything. And that's what it is. They give me a little time once in a while so I can kind of rejoice. Now when the anointing for healing is on, I just keep praying, fasting, and it gets to a place you feel a real sacred, calm feeling. Not like rejoicing. You just feel a real sacred feeling. But when you're speaking of the Holy Spirit, then it comes with joy and happiness and gladness and the refreshing from the presence of the Lord. And I'm very happy to, to have that this afternoon. Just before we go into service, I read a text that, if we should call it a text, I thought I'd make myself clear first that I wasn't a preacher, because you people hearing these good preachers around here, well then, you're no different in a few minutes. But what I wanted to tell you was a little bit upon divine healing just before we read the Word. Uh, so many people uh, think that divine healing it's just a hocus-pocus affair. That isn't it. It's plain, simple, and the gospel of Christ. Now, what would you think if I told you this afternoon that every sick person in this building was healed? That's right, oh. <laughs> That's true. As far as God's concerned, you're healed. See? Many times people want to debate, you're not long ago this minister where the picture was taken, wanted to debate the subject of whether Christ said Christ didn't atone for our sickness when he atoned for our sins. Now here's what it is, friends. And sometimes 
It's just so simple if you'll just try to understand it. How many sick people show this afternoon? Let's see your hands. I know there's a group of you. All right? Now I want you to do this. I want you to get just what I'm saying now and then hold to it while I'm speaking. Will you do it? You'll never live any higher than you confess that you are. It's your confession that saves you. He that could confess me before man, him will I confess before my Father and the holy angels. When you say you're sick, you're sick. Now, that, I'm not preaching Christian science now. I'm preaching the power of God when the Holy Spirit bears record of it. But here's what it is. You accept him because that you feel that he saved you and you go telling people, testifying of it, and believing your testimony, and it works righteousness. It'll do the same thing for healing. Now, here's what happens. Sin is what brought sickness in the world. Sickness is a result of sin. Now, before we had any sickness, we had no sin. And when sin came, sickness was a result of sin. So Jesus came to rid us of sin. And to rid, there's not a gospel preacher in the world but what would believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Well, then that's worth that here, up this place here now. Watch close. Here's where he paid the price. And when he died for our sins, as a result of his death, sickness fell right in with it. See? In other words, if my foot was what was you wanted to kill, kill the head, you got the foot. <laughs> See? The foot goes in with it. That's when he atoned for our sins. He atoned for the sins' results. Sickness is an attribute of sin. And Jesus died for our sins and sickness, iniquity, and all was included in his death for our sins. You see it? Then when he died for the sins of the world, there at Calvary, he healed you, 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 every one of you. And you're already healed. You're already forgiven of your sins if you will just accept it. Now, you don't go to hell because you're a sinner. You go to hell because you refuse to accept the way away from hell. There's a bypass. That's Christ. There's a bypass from your sickness, quick death, premature grace. That's through Christ. But now you're, you're, you sinned in the beginning, and Christ died for your sins. Therefore, he saved you when he died. He saved you, and he healed you when he died. For he took your place. But now all you have to do is to accept it by faith, and you will receive it. See what I mean? Now, there's nothing more to be done because your healing's already paid for. You can have it right this afternoon. You can have it right now. This very minute, when you believe it, when your faith meets God's requirement to believe that Christ died for your sickness, when he died for your sins, and he died for your sins at Calvary, and accepted upon that basis, at that moment, you are healed in the sight of God. See? Then you go on testifying of it, believing it. You don't, we, you testify of the things you do not see. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things you do not see. And we look at the unseen. Abraham, 25 years before Isaac was born, testified and believed God when he was 100 years old. Paul, before uh, the storm ever ceased, knew what was going to happen because he had God's word for it. Amen. Now, you've got God's word for it this afternoon. And I wish you would do this. If you'll do this, here's a challenge that I'll make as a minister of the gospel. If you believe this afternoon, and the Holy Spirit will come down into our midst, and you can actually, while you're praying, feel the Holy Spirit in your heart that He's accepted your prayer. If you'll stand on that, right there and believe it, don't fool with any more prayer line. You don't need it. 
if you will believe it right there where you are, then that settles the sickness or the rest of the way out. That'll do it. Then rise with a stern faith. Walk boldly. Say, how do you know you're well? Because God said I was and I believe his word. That's why. Now, you're not saved because you feel like that you're saved. If I have somebody say, I know I'm saved because I had a chill run through me and so forth, that's not why I'm saved. Satan could whip me around the stuff anywhere and he can you too upon your feelings. That's right. But when I walk back and say, Thus saith the Lord, my faith is built on the word of God and he can't whip that away. Remember, Jesus had all the qualities of the Father in him. Do you believe that? Sure he did. All the fine gifts of God was in Christ his Son. For he was the offspring of God. But notice, when he met Satan, for your example, he never used one gift on him. When Satan came to him, he said, It is written, Deuteronomy 7, 14, I believe it's 8, 14, and also in the Psalm, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Satan caught him again upon the pinnacle of the temple. Jesus said, It is written, and he took him up to the top of the mountain. Jesus said, it is written. See? It is written. Now notice. Here it is. I want you to see it and get it now. The word of God, written word of God, will defeat Satan anywhere, any place, any time. It's written. There it is. Everybody wouldn't have gifts. Jesus brought it down to a place where those who do not have gifts and do not have very much faith could just say, it is written. There it is, and it's stand right on that. Corn will bring forth corn. Is that right? Barley will bring forth barley. Wheat will bring forth wheat. Jesus said that the word of God is a seed that a sower sowed. And every word will, every word of God, every promise of God will bring forth of its kind. Do you believe that? See? Now what does a farmer do? He sows the wheat. Well, look for a harvest. The next morning, what if he goes out and uncovers it and says, Why, it ain't sprouted. There's nothing to it. So I, I ain't going to have no wheat. Well, if he isn't going to have any wheat, if he keeps digging it up, looking at it, he'll never have wheat. You just sow it and let it alone. Amen. There it is. It's up to God to bring it forth. It's up to God to send the rain. And it's you to accept God on His Word. Hallelujah. And it's up to God to bring His Word to pass. No man's worth any more than His Word. And God's not worth a bit more than what His Word is. And I say this for the challenge and faith that every promise of God will be brought to pass if you take the right mental attitude towards it. That's right. Look at it. Believe it. John Sproul, many of you have heard of John, the glory barn years ago. Little Sal Lorraine's friend said him and his wife walking out one afternoon looking at a statue of Christ and he stand out criticizing. and he said, well, I don't see no suffering. Don't see nothing that looks like anything would be so great about that monument there. The guy said, well, you're looking at it wrong, sir. Said, you get down here to Alder. Said, there's an Alder built here. Said, now look up. He looked up through all my heart like the broke. See, just the way you look at it. If you look at the word was way back there and Christ lived years ago and he's not today and he's not the same yesterday and forever, that's just what you'll get out of it. But it's not to be looked off as history. It's to be get down and look up to it and believe it. The way you look at the word of God. Now, accept it right now and say to God right now in prayer. Lord, this afternoon, I'm sitting here sick. I've seen all these ministers preach the word. I've seen Christians. I've seen prostitutes made ladies and saints. I've seen drunkards on the street come in and become gentlemen and upright men. Saints of God become gospel preachers by preaching the word. I believe you sent those men. Say, now, Father, I... I've seen someone come in claiming the gift of divine healing to know the hearts of the people. I see that. And I know that you're dwelling in your people all over the world. You're moving over through your people. And this afternoon, 
I'm going to accept you as my divine healer and my divine Savior. And I'm going to believe it and confess it and stay with it if you'll just bless me this afternoon and make it so in my heart that I can believe it. Will you make God that promise? Will you do it? Do you just say, say, I promise that, Lord. If you'll just touch me with a little faith this afternoon, then I'm going to believe it and walk out of here and be a healed person the rest of my life. I'll refuse to see anything else but the promise of God. Now you do that. That's the only way you can be healed. It's by faith, so accept it, believe it, and God shall bring it to pass. Or the star ahead. Our Heavenly Father, we've gathered here now for a few moments of the Word, speaking the Word. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing of the Word. And now, as we're just about to open up the Bible and read it, we realize that no man can open the book. John said no man in heaven or on earth could open the book or beneath the earth. But the Lamb, which had been slain from the foundation of the world, was worthy to come take the book out of the hand of him that set upon the throne and to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And now may the Lamb of God by the Holy Spirit, come right into this meeting this afternoon. Take the Word of God and just open it up into every heart. And may as they receive the Word, may thy servant's lips be circumcised to speak, and may their hearts be circumcised to receive. And may the fruits be a hundredfold, while we ask it in the lovely name of thy Son, Jesus. Amen. In the book of St. Matthew, or St. John, rather, the 11th chapter, I wish to read just a few verses, you that wants to mark it down, just of an old familiar text that many a times your pastors talked on them, and the resurrection of Lazarus, beginning at the 20th verse and down to the 27th inclusive. Listen closely to the word. I know it's awfully hot in here this afternoon. But, old friends, we're here trying to bypass a pace that will be much hotter than this. There'll be no fans down there, and, and we want to bypass that great place, don't we? Called hell. All right. Now, 11th chapter of St. John and the 20th verse beginning. I tell you, I like you people here bringing your Bibles and reading the Word. I like that. You're very nice. Crowd hasn't been what we what I thought they would be here because it's way out of town and we've had difficulties. But what's been coming has been a lovely, lovely group of people, seeming with a great faith, very obedient, just as nice of groups as you could speak to anywhere in the world as I am. Now listen closely to the word. Then Martha, as soon as she heard Jesus was coming. Went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if I had been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask God, God will give it thee. I like that, don't you? Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. See what that kind of faith brings. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, listen to this closely. Yea, Lord. Oh, I love that. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Can we pray now? Father, bless thy word as it's been read. May it go forth now and sink into the hearts as I speak on it. And may the Holy Spirit bring a hundredfold for healing of the body and for the soul also. And may there be an old-fashioned revival start here, Father. 
We're longing, praying, knowing that's the only hope that's left in the world now. For all kingdoms and powers will be shook and moved. But we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Help us today, God, to introduce this kingdom and may man press their way into it. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this was in the early part of the ministry of our Lord. He was born in the world, had a bad start just to begin. You know, I like to think of him as how, if you ever know who Jesus really is, then you can appreciate his great sacrifice so much more. You have to know who he is first. He wasn't just a righteous man or a good man. He was the Son of God. No one, no angel, no nothing else could have ever took the place but he. And he was willing to come down for us. And when he was born, he born on the earth here, he come by the way of a stable and went out the way of capital punishment. And yet we complain sometimes because we have a few trials and troubles. Well, look what, he, what happened to him. You know why he was born in a stable? Because he was a lamb. Lambs are not born in houses, they're born in barns. And he was, you notice, to the Calvary, they led him away to the slaughter. That's the way they do lambs, they lead them away. He was God's lamb, provided lamb, provided for us, that we sinners might have access to God through him. Now, when he was born, his reputation he was supposed to have been a legitimate child. They said that Joseph was his father and that Mary was his mother, but Joseph actually was his father. Not long ago up in the mountains, I met a man, an old trapper, and he told me, he said, he was supposed to have a real education. He was a scientist, had been. And he'd come up there in the winter and went to trapping. He just liked it much better, so he just stayed because it was peaceful. And he said to me, he said, you believe that story about the virgin birth? I said, every word of it. He said, you don't really believe that, Billy? And I said, yes, I do, every word of it. He said, why, well, it's impossible. He said, he couldn't have been born like that. So that's against all scientific research. I said, I don't know what scientific research is against. But it's not against God's word. And I said, God said that he was his son, and I believe it. He said, well, it depends on who you think God was. If you want to say Joseph was God, it's all right. I said, Joseph was a man like you and I. But God is Jehovah, the spirit of God, the spirit that brewed over the earth. He said, oh, that's impossible. He said, Billy said, corn can't even make, or nothing. He said, no baby could be born without actual Contact between male and female. I said, Grampy, I hate to dispute your word as an old man, but I said, you're wrong there. He said, you don't really believe that that baby was born. I said, I believe that Jehovah God overshadowed a little virgin called Mary and created in her womb a blood cell without knowing any man at all, and from there came the Son of God. And we're not born... And that by his righteous holy blood, without sexual desire, he died at Calvary, giving his blood that we could be free from sin. Brother, you believe that? Yes. If you don't, you're lost, that's all. Because it's in the blood we're saved by the blood of God. The, we're the blood of our Father. Jesus was the blood of his Father, which was holy, unadulterated blood, not by sexual desire, but by holy uh, ghost was he born, conceived in the womb of Mary and was born. I believe it with all my heart. He said, I just can't see that that could be so. He said, because it could not produce without actual contact. And he said, no, they had to be. I said, look, Grampy, will you admit to me then after a few days of argument, he met down there in a, in a little old cabin where there's a bunch of men, he started again. I said, will you admit to me that he had an earthly mother, but it's impossible for anything to be born on this earth without having literal father and mother. He said, that's exactly right. I said, I want to ask you something then. 
If you say it's impossible for him to be here by Jehovah God, the Creator, without an earthly father, yet you give him credit for having an earthly mother, then how did the first man get here without father or mother? He had to have a pappy and mammy somewhere, let him be a tadpole, monkey, whatever you want to call him. He had to have a papa and a mama, according to him. He's never answered me yet today. That's right, and he can. God the Creator made man in his own image. That's the way I believe it. He said, well, Darwin said so-and-so. I haven't got faith enough to believe that. I just believe what God said about it. My faith is what the Lord said. And he came into this world under a critic and went out the way of capital punishment, a Calvary, a sin offering. But his birth was glorious. The angels of God came down and sang about it back from the beginning of time. I believe that he was the woman's seed that was to bruise the serpent's head. I believe that. And he was to come through the woman, a Savior. And notice, then when he was, before he was born, great things were taking place. There was a remnant of people who were believing, having faith that God was going to send the Messiah. It had got down to just a very few, but God always has had a remnant of people, and a holler too loud, always a remnant of people who believe His Word. You believe it? And He's got today somebody, somewhere, who will believe Him. I trust that we're all in that group this afternoon. Notice, then, when he spoke to the prophets and told them all about him coming, everyone down to the age told about his birth. John the Baptist told about it. When John was a very peculiar child, when his father, Zachariah, his mother, Elizabeth, When they were old and past the age of bearing, Zechariah was a righteous man, God-fearing man. God give us some more Zacharias today. God-fearing men and women offered prayer in their home, supplications before God. Zechariah was at the temple one day making his offering, burning incense as it was his lot. And God sent an angel by the name of Gabriel, came down from heaven and stood by the altar. Notice what kind of a man he came to now. A man that was righteous. A righteous man is not a sinless man, but a man that depends on his righteousness by confessing his wrongs to God. Notice, then the angel said to, to the priest, Zacharias, he said, when the days of his ministration was over, he is to go home, and his wife was going to conceive and bring forth a child, and to call his name John. Now, Zacharias, yet a priest, a minister of the word, failed to believe the angel. Notice. Then the angel said, when God has spoken anything, he will perform it. Amen. You believe that? He's going to have a church. I don't know who's in it, but he's going to have a church without spot or wrinkle. Somebody, I don't know who it is, but it will be there. You say, where will they get it? I don't know. But it's going to be there for God has said so, and God can't lie. Notice. Now, when anything's going to happen on the earth, first God sends a messenger, and that messenger is anointed by an angel. Now, sometimes minor angels come. These minor angels and major angels. Now, this angel that came was Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. That was something major. 
And he came down, and when Gabriel comes from heaven, remember, something's going to happen. Gabriel announced the first coming of Jesus. Gabriel will announce the second coming of Jesus. The trump of God shall sound. First, an angel. Notice, then he came and he announced that John was to be born. And Zechariah, priest, righteous man, yet without the appropriated faith. You get what I mean? Many people come into life, I've been a Christian for 30 years, that's good. But what about your faith now? God don't heal you on the merits of your salvation, He heals you on the merits of your faith. If ye believe, hallelujah. Notice, if ye believe, he never said to the Gentile woman anything, but said, If ye believe. All right. That's the question. Can you believe God and take Him at His word? Oh, my, if we do that, there'd be a hallelujah. Sweep the country. Healings would come from everywhere. You see, man, out on the street holding one hand all over the other, claiming God will heal him. Stand with it. God will bring it to pass. That's right. Because he's under obligation, he swore that he would do it. Them days when they made a covenant, they would take a lamb or a beast. They would write a covenant out, two men between them. They would write it out what it was. And then they would kill a beast. And over this beast, they would tear this thing in two. One man would take one part and one the other. And then in order to confirm this covenant, that man had to take this same piece of paper and bring it back, and it had to perfectly, I hear it is, it had to perfectly dovetail with the piece it was torn off from. Now God made a covenant with the church. And he wrote it off the Bible. And on the day of the atonement, God killed his son. You believe it? Tore him apart. And he took his body up to the right hand of his majesty and sent his spirit back as a cover to us. And at that day, unless we have that same Holy Spirit in us, we can't go in the body. That's just the old sassafras preaching the Lord Savior. That's right. We have to have the Spirit of Christ in us. The same Spirit that come out of that body to make up His body to go back again with Him. Oh, my. That's right. God made a covenant with us. And then... Our priest, he didn't believe God. Didn't believe the angel. And the angel said, Because you haven't believed my word, I'm Gabriel who stands before God. You'll be dumb to the day the baby's born. Zechariah came out and beckoned to the people. They perceived that it's an angel. Went up into Judea in the hilly country where he lived. And then his wife, past the age of barren, conceived and hid herself. Months away, or she was going to be a mother. Then six months later, God sent Gabriel again. Oh my, I just love him. Uh, I get pretty happy once in a while. You may think I'm a little noisy for a Baptist, but I'm one Baptist got the Holy Ghost, so <laughs> it, it, it one gets noisy. <laughs> So don't think I'm a fanatic cause or not. If you felt the same way I did, you'd probably be doing the same thing. Notice, he sent Gabriel again to the meanest city on the earth. Minneapolis has a chance then, don't they? All right. Meanest place on the earth. Nazareth to a little virgin who lived right before God. Poor, not the rich and haughty. God don't 
look at your money the way you dress. He looks at your heart. Hallelujah. I'm glad that this old time salvation will make a pair of overhauls a tuxedo suit hug one another. Call a brother. It'll make a calico dress and silk set together and call each other sister. Takes away pride. That's what's the matter with the church today. Got too starchy, too much pride. Lay down, you're a six foot of dirt anyhow. That's right. Got a soul's got to meet God someday. That's what's the matter with our Pentecost church or other holiness churches. They get up to pride. We get a good church in a nice place and think we want to pattern out the world. That's where God's people always got in trouble when they pattern out the rest of them. He's our pattern. Hallelujah. The matching time. You paint your steps red and see if the neighbor don't paint his steps red. That's right. Buy a mercury and see if the neighbor don't want a mercury. They want to match. I don't care whether my pants match, my coat or my shirt matches my suit. I want my experience to match God's Bible. That's the kind of matching Christians ought to have. Now whether Jones has got a big church and I got a little one, I want Christ. Hallelujah. That's right. Hallelujah. Yes. There, for comes, friends, Mary, a little innocent virgin down in Nazareth, and maybe we'll call it wash day, I don't know. Monday's usually at my house when my wife washes. It's always a hard day. We used to have to pack the water and boil in an old uh, tub behind the house, and you know what I mean, and wash, and I'd help wash too. Old cedar tub, high up. Good times, though. As long as you love the Lord, what difference does it make? Happiness does not consist of how much this world is good you are, it's how contented you are with the potions lotted to you. That's what happiness means. Find Christ and you got happiness. Lord. Yeah, that's true. Then here, look at Gabriel. Comes down from the heavens by the command of God. All oh, those many girls around through there, probably with manicured hair, what you call it, and all that kind of stuff around, like they had, I said the wrong word, but I don't know about how they do it, but it, you know, but he came to a simple, plain, humble believer. Hallelujah. Oh, that's the way he does today, too. You don't entice God by the way you dress. You entice God by the way you live and think and act. God, help us to get back to the old-fashioned Holy Ghost gospel. Amen. I believe in it, don't you? Old-time, back sky blue, sin-killing religion. That's right. Hallelujah. It'll help you. It'll save you. All right. Here she was. Going down probably to get some water. Let's dramatize it just a minute so the little fellows can pick it up. Maybe she's going down to get some water. The Oriole type, they packed it on their head. Big old pitcher with the wings out on the side of her handles. And I can see little Mary, about 17 years old, engaged to a man about 45. Some children here, she come up along. But she was righteous in her heart because Joseph was a just man before God. be a lot better if women, young ladies today, pick something like that today. Did of some little boy with a pack of cigarettes in his pocket. And not long ago, this little girl there at the tabernacle in my church, she's a sweet little old girl, little Christian girl, she's running around with some little old boy, packed a flask in his pocket and smoked cigarettes. I couldn't see nothing in the boy myself. Tried for two or three years to get him to be a Christian, but he went to I asked her, I said, Sis, why are you seeing that boy? You know what kind of answer she gave me, like some of these Bobby Stock kids today? She said, Brother Brown said he just got this cute little feet and it smells so good. I thought, what a way to pick a husband. I said, I'd rather marry a man that was a Christian that had feet like a box car and smell like a polecat. If he was a Christian, right. Uh, oh, that's right. By the blood of Christ, we are saved. Hallelujah. Amen. You'll make a woman for you and be a gentleman if he's saved. Oh. All right. 
Not with the outward appearance, but by the heart of God. Hallelujah. True. Years ago, we had a good old-fashioned church to tell me how it wasn't in them days where the people got together, they sang praises to God, they shouted and praised Him, glorified Him, and today, my, all that's fading away, it's time to get back. That's right. To the days when God will bless us. Notice, then Mary on her road up as we go with our drama, she was walking along probably singing, some hymn and chanting some psalm. Oh, the sudden a big light left they swarmed before her. And standing in this light stood a great angel. Oh, oh my, it frightened the little virgin. It would frighten you. I know how I felt myself when one appeared. And the angel said, Hail, Mary. In other words, stop. Blessed art thou among women, for you found favor with God. And so now he began to tell her about uh, Elizabeth, her cousin. John and Jesus were second cousins, and Mary and, and Elizabeth were first cousins. And said that she had found favor before God, and she was going to conceive and bring forth a child without knowing any man. Now I want you to notice something closely. Look, when the angel came to the priest, Zechariah, and told him that Sarah, or Elizabeth was going to have a child by him. He had plenty of examples before that. Hannah had had a child past the age of Aaron. Sarah, nearly 100 years old or better, had brought her child after the age of Aaron. Plenty of examples. But that callous priest failed to believe God. But Mary never. She never questioned she said, Behold, the hands made of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Amen. Notice, she didn't wait till she was positive. She didn't wait till she felt something, felt right. She started right then praising God for it, for she had his promise. Brother, sister, give us some more Mary here in Minneapolis who will take God at his word. Not wait till you feel something or something happens. Take his word and start rejoicing about it. Amen. Hallelujah. God said he's the healer. I believe it. Amen. He said he saved me. I believe it. Amen. Take his word and start rejoicing about it. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the kind of people we need. Went right around telling everybody she's going to have a baby and there's no sign or nothing of it. She didn't have to have any signs. Only thing she had to have was God's word. That's all we have to have. God said, so that settles it with me. What about you? Believe it. Take him at his word and say it's so and just go ahead. That's all you have to have is his word. Found to bring it forth. You believe it, brother? Stay with it. Hallelujah. That's right. Stay with it. It'll bring the results every time. I've never seen it fail. When a true heart come before God in this business and took God at his word and started testifying of it and looking to the unseen, that God's promises always produces what he's asked for. That's right. All right. Mary went around telling the folks that she was going to have a child knowing no man. Right quick, she, the angel told her about her cousin, and up into Judea she went to see her. Oh, my, there's something about the gospel. When we hear the good news, we like to tell others, don't we? Everybody gets saved wants to tell somebody else. Everybody gets healed wants to tell somebody else. The way she went to bring her cousin the good news that she was going to have the child and how that her cousin was going to have a child. All right. I can see her going up to the house and let's do a little drama here again. I can see Elizabeth sitting on the porch uh, maybe doing her, her, her work, knitting her, whatever what she might be doing. And Mary comes up. Real quick, as soon as Mary comes, she sees Elizabeth, my poor Christian women, as we would call it today, ran out, threw their arms around one another, hugged one another, kissed one another, saluting each other. Oh, I like that. I like a oh, good warm feeling, don't you? I hate that old cold fall away we got. People today, they're so far away from one another, you don't care for one another. That's what's the matter. Even church members get the same way. You don't care for one another. 
Why, by the way, they won't try to shove him down. Don't shove him down. Pick him up. Help him. That's right. Don't try to criticize him. Tell somebody else. Go to him with your arms around him. And the day they got so afraid, they don't even want to shake hands anymore. I like a good old Methodist pump handle handshake. You know what? I'm kind of get right down and shake. You know, long ago I was in a meeting. There was some kind of a princess or something or other. I don't remember from. She come to the meeting. She had on about enough clothes to water must a shotgun. And if I'd have seen her before the meeting, I would have put my coat on her while I was preaching. I would have done that. And she come up after the meeting holding a pair of glasses on a stick, you know, out like this on a funny looking thing. No clothes hardly on at all. Come walking up like this. And she said, I want to meet Dr. Brand. Dr. Brand. The very idea. No doctor, I'm your brother. And she come up. And one of the manager brought over to me, you know, like that, this introduced and said, this is so-and-so, some kind of a big long name, said, well, Dr. Branham, she said, I'm charmed. She had her hand up like this one. Well, I grabbed her the hand, going down, I said, bring it down here, so I'll go, you want to see you again? I said, get down here. Oh, I don't like that old put on. Starchy. Why, anyhow? You got to stand in the presence of God someday to give an account for that sin. Oh, no. Answer before God. There she was, standing all like that. Used to be a long time ago when a neighbor got sick or something. He went over and cut his corn, cutting some wood up his winter time. It's a day the neighbor can die, and you don't know it until you read the paper. That's right, no friendship among one another anymore. That's awful, love. Because the iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, said Jesus in Matthew's 24th chapter. That's true. Now, and she began to talk to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth began to talk to her, and I can hear Elizabeth, uh, Mary say to Elizabeth, let's listen to their conversation. I can hear Elizabeth say, or Mary say to Elizabeth, oh, I am so happy because I've been told that you are going to be a mother in your old age. And of course she could see that and know that. And I can hear Elizabeth say, yes, I'm, I, I am. Oh, I'm so happy about it. But Mary, I, I'm just a little afraid. See, it's six months with me as mother, and as far as we know, the baby had no life. She was a little weary yet about it, you know. Little John was there, and that's all the other stuff natural, you see. It's, it's not right. And so about two or three months' life, and here she's all this time and no life yet. And Mary said, the angel Gabriel met me and told me that I was going to bring forth a son also, and I was to call his name Jesus. For well, just the time that she spoke Jesus, little John began to leap and jump in his mother's womb. Brother, the first time the name of Jesus Christ was ever spoke, it brought life to a dead baby. What ought to bring to the Holy Ghost Church when the name was sin. Hallelujah. Yes. That name, Jesus Christ, when it was spoke first by mortal's lips, it brought life to a baby that was dead in his mother's womb. The Bible says he received the Holy Ghost and was born from his mother's womb, full of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah! Oh my! What's the matter with Christians? Wishy washy, half jellyfish, get a backbone in you and stand up for God and what's right in the day. Stand for what the Bible says and believe it with all your heart. Little John began to leap in his mother's womb for joy. And the Holy Spirit came upon Elizabeth. She said, Whence cometh the mother of my Lord? For as soon as your salutation came into my ears, my baby leaped in the womb for joy. Oh, my, think what I've done. When Jesus' name was spoke, brought life to that dead baby. What are to bring to your limbs, sir? What are to bring to your sickness? You man sitting here and you over there. Take the name of Jesus with you everywhere you go. Breathe it everywhere in prayer. Be loyal. Be holy. Live for God. And God will confirm His word. Oh, yes, sir. He swore that He'd do it. There you are. The word. Come into your ears. Their babies begin to leap for joy. They was hugging one another. After a while, as they left, after a few days up there, and then they wondered when this little child, what kind of boy he would be. 
When John was born, we were commonly believed that he was about eight years old or nine. He was taken into the wilderness, not to the theological cemetery or seminary. It's all about the same thing. <laughs> That's not right. Even if I did see one. That's true. You know, a seminary preacher always reminds me, I don't hurt your feelings, brother. I hope. But look, it does get some man once in a while. A seminary preacher reminds me of the incubator chicken. This church, church, church ain't got no man in That's right. Got a great big call down there. I'd rather have a man that didn't know split beans from coffee and no God in his heart to deal with my people than I would some man with enough education to choke a mule and know nothing about God. That's right. God bless your heart, brother, and old fashioned psychographic experience. What we need to do. We don't want an old genealogy. You need a little neonology. That's what man needs today. Back to God. Back to the prayer life. Oh, water seeking out. Hey, hold on to God till it comes to pass. God will do it. Hallelujah. I don't get as sure as that. Hallelujah means praise our God. He's worthy of all of it. Amen. I believe it. Amen means so be it. You won't scare me when you say it. <laughs> All right. Notice, here we are now. And little John, when he was born, was taken out into the wilderness and stayed with God. When he, then Jesus was born. We know all about his birth. Six months later, when, little, when Jesus, John, came out of the wilderness, look at him, how he come. My, my. He came and I've often wondered what John was preaching. What a man. People didn't go out to see how he's dressed. He had an old pair of hairy trousers on, a piece of a strip around him out of a camel skin to tie on this old piece of goods he had around him or an old uh, hairy animal skin around him. And he came out, stood on the banks of Jordan, one of those seats to sit in. That may be hard, but they didn't have it at all. But he stood all the regions around about Jordan. Thank of it. No seminary experience. Not how to stand up and say, Oh, man like a dying cat. But he, he had a message from God. That's right. He didn't preach vain human philosophy. He preached Christ and his turn to nation. God bless your heart. Give us some more Baptists like that. I believe them. Amen. That's right. I said to Bishop my logo, produce me some more Johns. He preached the Holy Ghost and he had the Holy Ghost. Yes, sir. He didn't draw any punches either. He put it right out the way they belong. And he preached and he stirred all the regions. Why? He preached Christ. That's right. Christ preached the his simplicity will stir the people. It's the power of God. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. That's true. Notice closely after Jesus, then we have to hurry because I get taught my time's already gone. About ten minutes left. Oh, my. We just never get through talking about him. And how... Jesus, when he was baptized, I can see, let's take a little drama again. I can see uh, Jesus and Lazarus were friends and played together. They knew not each other. Lazarus, we're taught, was kind of was a scribe at the temple, and maybe the, his daughter, his sisters, made tapestries and so forth, or done some needlework. Just in our, our drama picture now, I can see Jesus and Lazarus playing together. And after a while, Lazarus comes back and tells Jesus, My, there's a mighty prophet standing down on Jordan. He speaks of one greater than he's the coming who will baptize the Holy Ghost and fire. You ought to go down and see. And little did he know he was talking right then to the man. You don't know who's sitting right next to you today. And then church and that fellow's made a mistake. That's one of God's sons, the daughter of God's daughter. Don't turn him down. Help him. That's right. Put an arm around him. You don't know what God could do with him. If you just help him a little. That's right. And then, after a while, I can see Jesus go with John, or go with Lazarus down and was baptized of him in the Jordan. And Jesus went into the wilderness. And when the Father had spoken, had, had testified of his son, vindicated him to be his beloved son in whom he is well pleased. And out into the wilderness, he went to be tempted of the Spirit. That's just the way it happened. When you get the Holy Ghost, the first thing the devil comes right on for temptation. When you claim your healing, 
what the devil come right along to back up and say it's wrong. That's the time to stand because you don't testify what you see or feel. You testify what you believe. That's right. Stay with us. Out into the wilderness and was tempted to the devil. Return back. This ministry of time by text. Now we'll get just as quick as we can. It got to a place where crowds was coming from everywhere and being healed and listening to his precious words as he fell from his lips. His ministry got so great until it was pushing out. Oh my, the people were coming. His tasting of that honey that fell out of his mouth. Last night when I was reading that text of St. Luke, the fifth chapter, how did they come to hear his word pressed upon him, to hear the word of God? How glorious. The church today ought to be pressing everywhere to hear the word of God, staying with the word. We're the church natural or the church spiritual, just like Israel was the church natural. We were brought out of bondage, human bondage, just like Israel was brought out of Egyptian bondage. You believe that? We come across, we had a sacrifice to come out by. The blood on the lintel, the door and on the post, just the cross, perfectly. No one was to go out of the blood after once coming in until the call come to go out. They crossed Jordan, or across the Red Sea, type of the blood, sanctifying power of God, killing all sin, nature of sin behind the taskmaster, the cigarettes, the whiskey, the road houses, the picture shows, everything that bothers you back there and hinders your Christian experience, died in the blood of Christ. Yes, sir, brother. If you've ever once been purged by the blood of Christ, them things are dead if it isn't. If you love the world, the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in you. That may be a little hard to be taught here, but it's the truth. Let me tell you, I don't have measuring sticks in church, nor not a bit, no sir. Oh, 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 tree you have around your holes, it's leaves all winter long. Spring of the year comes, you don't have to go pick the old leaves off. Just like the new life comes in, the old leaves drops off. That's what it is, let Christ come into the heart, the rest of it will take care of itself, that's right. Just get Christ in the heart, it'll take care of the rest. And as they marched over, how beautiful that type our church is today. How did they cross to the Red Sea? And then Moses began to sing in the Spirit. Miriam picked up a tambourine and began to dance, just like an old-fashioned Holy Ghost meeting, dancing and singing and praising the Lord. Why? They had the victory. Amen. They got the victory all the time. The next morning, and when they went out, man, are laid all over the ground. God out of heaven. They tasted it and it tastes like honey. Oh my, there's something about honey that's sweet. David, a shepherd, used to, the old shepherds of the days gone by used to have a strip bag on them. And they put honey in that strip bag and when their sheep would get sick, they'd take that honey and pour it on a rock and let the sick sheep go to licking on that rock. When they licked off the honey, they got some of the limestone out of the rock and it healed the sheep. Now look, brother, I got a whole spit bag full of honey. Now I'm going to put it on the rock like Jesus, you six feet, get the licking right quick, and see if you don't get wet off. Yes, sir, lick with all you can. Hallelujah. And brother, I put it on Christ Jesus, not on the Baptist, Methodist, or Presbyterian Church, or whatever it may be. It belongs on Christ. Don't lick on your church, lick on God. Hallelujah. That's where the promise is. Not what Dr. So-and-so said about it, but what God said about it. That's the one to believe. Yes, sir. Something about that stone hold to us in the old days when they used to push and get mad dog bit. They'd take the, the person that was mad dog bit and take them to the mad stone. If they stuck to the stone, they got well. If they didn't stick, they died. Oh, the worst devil, or worst mad dog I know is the devil. He fit all of us in a, in a way, that's right. And I'll tell you, there's a rock, Christ Jesus. Get to it, stick to it, hold on to it. Hallelujah, it'll bring you through. Just stick right to the rock of ages, oh. let me hide my intelligence. Hold oh. on, but your life is your thing. Watch it, see if you don't get well. Just stick to the rock, it'll bring you through. That's right, yes sir. And... Let's look at honey just a little bit longer the wafer. It tastes like honey, he said, in the rock. Now, that was a type of the Holy Spirit. God told Moses, have Aaron, go get an omer full of it and take it in the place where he's supposed to be kept the holy of holies that every generation passing down through from that on. When there's 
tongue songs would ask them what was this for, and every priest that was in the of the priesthood noticed as soon as he stepped in behind into the priesthood, he had a right to taste a bite of the original manna that fell in the beginning. Yes, sir. He could have a bite as sure as he was ordained in the priesthood. He could taste of the original manna. How beautiful that is of the Holy Spirit, our sustaining strength to carry the church on. If they fail each manna, they die. And if we fail each on the Holy Ghost, we die. If we fail to pray through daily, all the time, keep on the book, you'll wither up and die in your Christian experience. And now, friends, as it was on the day of Pentecost, when our manna was poured out, while yeah, they were all gathered in one place in one accord, and it wasn't arguing whether they were Methodist, Baptist, or Lutheran, they were in one place in one accord, expecting God to keep his word. Or Luke 24, 49, he said, Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you're due with power from on high. Acts 1 uh, said, And when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, then you'll be witness to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And 120 people had gathered together in the upper room, waiting for their sustaining strength to take them among the people. And all of a sudden there came a sound from heaven, like a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, cold and tongues that appeared upon all night far, out into the street. And let me tell you something right now, Virgin Mary and them was right among them. That's right. And if God would respect the Holy Virgin Mary to get to heaven any other way besides receive the Holy Ghost pouring, what about you? That's right. You'll have to pay the same price, get the same experience, have the same thing as you had back there in the beginning. And I tell you, when the power of God began to fall, they lost all dignity and everything else out into the street, staggering like drunk oh, man. Oh, Holy Ghost! Oh, my! Peter said the promise is to you and to your children and the land that fall off, even Minneapolis, Minnesota, and as many as the Lord our God shall call. Brother, I'm telling you, every man that will pay the price to step out for Christ has a right to receive a baptism, not something you make out, but an original right there in the beginning, like you're over there at Pentecost. Oh. 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 You don't have to see some duplicate or something. There you get a taste of the original manna that fell on the day of Pentecost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. There they were. Receive the Holy Ghost. Right. You want to marry the church today? It needs a good old time. St. Paul revival in the Bible. Holy Ghost called in the beginning. That's right. Take fire coming down from heaven. Remember when I was a little boy, he was walking out on the creek one time. I seen an old turtle. That was the funniest looking thing I ever seen. An old parrot. And he showed his legs like that. My little brother and I looked high as a wall. We got up to him. He got up in his chair. Or just some of these cold, formal Christians. Like when you go to talk to him about the Bible. Oh, Dr. Don't get that wrong. Oh, my. Go up in your chair. That's all right. All right. I said, let's make him walk again. I got this switch and I could beat him to death. He wouldn't walk. You can't beat it out of him. I called, they just walked and puffed and blow. So I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make him go. I'll take you down here to the water and I'll fix him up. I stuck him down to the creek and I put him down. Just a few bubbles come up and that was all. Brother, you can baptize him this way, that way. Plant some pole, face forward, backwards. He goes down a, a dry center and comes up a wet when he's still a sinner. It is your baptism in water that saves you. So I'll tell you what I did. I went and got a piece of paper and made a little bar and set the old boy on it. He walked in, I mean to say. That's right. And what the church needs to be is an old fashioned gospel of power. Power of the Holy Ghost turning on the altar and in every heart. It'll make the church go and walk. That's right. Yes, sir. Get the power of God back. Get the Holy Spirit back in the people's hearts again. Well, you're going to have a living faith in God when you say goodbye to him. Yes, I accept it. Hallelujah. That's right. Back to the Bible and back to the Holy Spirit. There. How wonderful. Now, Jesus and his ministry, going forth here in his precious word, they come to a place where he had to leave the home. And when he went out, sorrow and trouble came in. And when he goes out of your home, sorrow and trouble come in. When he goes out of your church, confusion and backsliding is coming in. When he leaves the house, trouble on his throne. Keep him with you all the time. Now in this case, of course, he wasn't drawn.
thing that you ignore it. Jesus knows all things that the Father has shown. That's the reason praise God times. And now if you send to your pastor and he didn't come and pray for you when you were sick, well you'd say you're a hypocrite, I'll go over and join Joseph's church or somebody. That's the reason your pastor can't do nothing for you. You've got to have faith in him and confidence in him as a man of God and know that all things work together for good to them that love God. That's right. Now, our pastor didn't tell me to say that either. But I know this, you've got to have confidence in the man you're dealing with or it won't be any good to do any dealing. That's true. You've got to believe your pastor. He's a good God-saved man. Preach the gospel. Stand by him with everything you got. If he isn't, go somewhere where you do it. That's right. Now, that clears up for both sides. Now, remember this. If he preaches the gospel, stay with him. Help him. Because he's a man sent from God, ordained of God, to feed your soul. And now, when they sent for Jesus, he went on. I believe that Jesus then knew what was going to happen. For if you think, when he passed by the pool of Bethesda, look at that, there was a great multitude of people. And the Bible speaks of a great multitude, probably means 10,000 at the least, of lame, halt, blind, withered, withered, blind, halt, dumb, waiting for the moving of the water, for God sent an angel down. Certain is that right? Then he even came to the angel. This wasn't the water, it was the angel. Well, the water said, Lord, drink water, I am. No, it wasn't the water, it was the angel. Well, from the angel was gone, it was just water. Is that right? Just the water. And Jesus passed by this pool and seen all that great quality. And he healed one man. He wasn't crippled. He had an infirmity for 38 years. And he healed him and walked away and left every one of those crippled women. Is that true? St. John the fifth chapter. Lift him everyone. Looked like a his compassionate heart would have went out and healed them all. It probably would. Well, watch the 19th chapter, the 19th verse of St. chapter, when the Jews was questioning. He said, Dearly, dearly, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son. Is that right? God had to show him first. So he didn't say he was a divine healer. He waited for God to show him a thing. A lot was going to happen, then he went and done it. Isn't that just the same way it's working today? What God says, then it's going to be that way. But you can't sin until God says it first. So if somebody thinks, somebody said, it, hey, I heard somebody said, oh, that's hocus, hocus. If you think it's hocus, hocus, then what do you think about Jesus Christ? That's right. He said the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father to do is that to us, the Son likewise. He had to wait for God to show him, and then he went and done it, so he'd done nothing unless God showed him first. I believe you've seen the resurrection of Lazarus. That's right. And when he went on, then he went on. After a while, he set off playing Lazarus. The disciples said he do us well. Then he told them in plain words, the way they'd understand it. He said, he said, but, listen, I love this. He said, and I'm glad I wasn't there. But I go waiting. He knew what the Father had told him to do. So he said, I go waiting. And away he went. Started back. Now, when Lazarus got sicker and sicker in them standing, oh, I discouraged him. Sent for the pastor to come pray for him. They left the church. They left everything to follow this man, this divine healer. And no, no hope of him coming. He just went on ignoring the message. What a God now. Then the first thing he knows, death struck, killed Lazarus, took him out dirty. The first day passed, oh, my hot dog. Second day passed, God. Third day Fourth day, all hope was gone. He's already a rotten in the grave. And the skin worms was going through him. All hope was gone everywhere. Discouraged. Their pastor had let him down. Their loved ones, the miracle worker, had let them down. Didn't come to the rescue. And there was Mary and Martha, left alone. Mother and father gone. Now just them two girls left alone in the world. Someone come along to to encourage them. They sat in sackcloth, black veils, and weeping and mourning over their brothers. And now, in the very darkest of hours, then Jesus came along. That's just the way he does. Amen. Brother, it may be your darkest of hour right now, but Jesus comes along just at the darkest of hours. When I think of it, it's the darkest hour the woman of the blood is you ever seen. She spent all her money. Then Jesus. It's the darkest hour of your eyes that ever seen you. 
who will go all the way dead, then Jesus come along. Is the dark that died that Peter and the apostles had ever seen on the sea look like he's going to drown? Then Jesus come along. Oh, brother, it was the dark that I ever seen two years ago at my old clinic when the best of the doctors walked me and said, Reverend Branham, you're a hopeless. You will never, never be able to finish your life. The dark that I ever seen, then Jesus come along. Oh, my. Oh, how I love him. Yes, sir. How I think of him, how he's done for me. I think amazing, great, how sweet the sound. Hey, he direct like me. I want to walk. But now I'm found with blind. But now I see so blind. They had to lead me around by my arms. I know that where it was going. Now my eyes like 20, 20. Laying a miserable, wretched thing dying. And Jesus came along. What a wonderful. How he comes just in the darkest of hours. Then somebody said, I hear him say, Say, that there divine healer. They wouldn't come when Lazarus was alive. He's sneaking back in town now. He's out there. Now look, Mary or Martha, she had read the story of how this humanite woman had a baby. And she, by, and when she, the baby died, she didn't know why it died, but she knew that she could get to the life of the prophet, that God was in the prophet. And whatever, she could find out what God meant by it when she could get to the prophet. So she told him to saddle a horse and go forward and stop now. So she commanded it. And she went to the prophet. The prophet said, here, I'm going to send you anointed cloth. In other words, I'm going to give you my staff. Go lay it on the baby. She said, as the Lord lives and your soul lives, I'll not leave you. You know, God was in the prophet. She stayed right with the prophet until she found out. Elijah went with her to the death chamber. And there walked up and down the room, not waiting for the baby, walked up and down the room. Then something stretched his body out over the baby. For God was in Elijah. Hallelujah. Oh, Christians, you don't realize what I'm talking about. I don't believe. See, look here. God was in Elijah. And God, Elijah knew it. The woman knew it. And he laid, he knows that's the reason he said that thing. He knows that everything he touched was blessed. For God was in him. Oh, you see what I mean? God was in him. And if he touched anything, it was blessed. <laughs> he didn't pray for the baby. He stretched his body over the baby. And the God that was in Elijah, the breath coming into the baby, you see, seven times he rose up well. And Mary knew, surely, or Martha, rather, if God was in Elijah, surely he was in his son. <laughs> oh, my, she knows she could get to him. She could find why her brother died. Right out of the city, I hear something saying, Now look where he's going now. She just pushed on by them, old crazy. Went right on out. Jesus hadn't got to town yet. And she got to where he was. Now watch. Looked like she had a right to bring him. Looked like she had a right to scold him. And say, Why didn't you come? Oh, I thought you could heal. If she would, the miracle would have never taken place. It's your approach to a divine gift what brings the result. It's the way you come to it. Isn't that right? The way you approach anything. She come in the right approach. She came out. She fell down on her knees. And she said, Lord, didn't disregard his title. Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother had not died. Oh, my. That touched me. She knew she could get right into his heart. She'd get what she wanted. She said, Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, Lord, whatever you ask God, God will do it. I like that. Even now, he's dead. He's been buried four days. Undertaker's taking him out there and bombed his body and put him away. He's been dead four days. He's just mortifying the earth there. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will do it. Oh, brother, sister, you might have tried everything there is in the world. You might have tried to get well. You man said you have cancer. You might have done everything. You'll got your hands. But even now, Lord, right now, when? I'll wait till the night service. No, even now, Lord, whatever you ask, God, you do it. When now? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, looking down right now, ready to make intercessions. But little Graham, I'll stop it. But even now, Lord, whatever you ask, God, God will do it. He's waiting for you to say, Lord, I believe. Yeah. Lord, I believe you even now. Whatever you ask God, God will do it. But Brother Ram, I, 
I'm deaf in one ear, but even now, Lord. Well, I've been prayed far before, but even now, Lord, for the whole life, whatever you ask God, Brother Bram, I've been trying to get the Holy Ghost for a long time, but even now, Lord, whatever you ask God, God will do it. There you are. That's what it takes. That's what faith is. Notice, he said, my brother shall rise again. My, let's straighten him up. My loud brother shall rise again. Watch the old prophetic calls now coming right together. The right place, the right person, the right time. My brother's dead in the grave. But you, if you'd have been here, you wouldn't have died. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will do it. That touching, that touching. Faith! Never been done before. Faith! Thy brother shall rise again. He said, Yea, Lord, he'll rise the last days and to sleep his general resurrection. Oh, uh, he'll rise again. He was a good boy. He'll raise in the last days, I know. Look at him. Oh, my. He was his own beauty you should design. Uh, I was probably a little afraid of looking so hot. We said, Man of sorrow, acquainted with grief, Frank seemed to straighten his little body up. Said, I am the resurrection life. Oh, my. That's it. I am the resurrection life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believe us thou this. He said, Yea, Lord, I believe. Look here. I believe that you are the Son of God. What you confess to me, that was the coming to the world. I believe what you say you are, what God has done for you. That's the truth. I believe every word of it. Where are you there? Oh, my God. Here's where a woman told me not long ago when I was, she said, Jesus was the divine. He was a good man, a good teacher, so forth, be good for people who live for that, just like with Santa Claus stories for the children, but that he wasn't divine. I said, oh, yes, he was divine. But no, he wasn't. I said, he was. She said, look, I can prove it. When he went down to the grave of Lazarus, he cried like a man. I said, yes, I believe he was more than a man. I believe he was a God man. I believe that God was in Christ reconciled the world to himself. I believe God lived in his son, dwelt in his son, and reconciled the world to himself by his son. Do you believe that? I do with all my heart. And he was more than a man. He was God, the God the Son, here on earth. Everything the Father had was in him. And I believe that he was a, a more than a man. He was a God man. And when he went down to the, to the grave, he cried like a man. That's true. But when he stood there, held himself and said, Oh, take away the stone. Said Lazarus, come forth. When he raised the dead, he was more than a man. He was God. He was a man when he was crying, but he was God when he raised the dead. That's right. Yes, sir, he was divine. Now, I tell you, when he come down off the mount that night, he was hungry like a man. When he was looking on a fig tree for something to eat, when he was a hungry like a man. But when he took five biscuits and fed five thousand, he was God. God was in his son. He was a God man. I know that he was he was a man that night when he was laying in that boat out there and all the waves dancing around ten thousand devils of the sea for there for drowning. He was a man when he was laying on the back of that boat, tired and weary. But when he raised and put his foot on the rail and looked up at that peace, he still it was God. Hallelujah! I believe he was a God man, he was more than a man. He was the divine part of God coming out of heaven. Yes, sir. I know he cried like a man when he was dying at the cross. Mid rending rocks and darkness, he died by pain. He died. That's right. He was a man when he was dying, but when he rolled on the first day, he proved he was God. That's right. God was in his son. He raised him up. He was divine. I believe every word of it. I can see him walking down to that place that then to the grave that take me away the stone. Look like it could have been a gentleman. He was talking to himself, but he asked them women to. Why? You've got your part to do. Yes, sir, you've got to do your part. They take you away the stone. And they took away the stone, and your feet was so bad. And it's like the suffocated there on top of a dead human body. Then I can see him taking his little step up again. Said, Father, I thank thee that thou hearest me always. But for these that stand by, why? Said, he'd already seen the vision. He knew what was going to happen. 
Then he cried with a loud voice and screamed, said, Lazarus, come forth. I believe, brother, if he had to call him specifically by the name of Lazarus, I believe the general resurrection was a great man. That's what I think about him. That's why I believe the resurrection of every dead thing that ever died would have come out of the grave if he just said, come forth. Yes, somebody called Lazarus, come forth. I'm glad today that my name's on his book. Someday he'll call you. I'll answer, said Joel, and there he called and led a man that had been dead four days, his body rotten, his soul four days journey somewhere out in, I don't know where he was, either to you, so we won't argue about that, but that man's soul had been gone four days, returned back, and a dead man stood on his feet and lived again. Leave us down this. Yes, sir. I believe it. I believe he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Believe us thou this. I believe he was the one that spoke to the seas and they stopped. Believe us thou this. I believe that he said in his word, these things that I do, greater shall you do. Believe us thou this. I believe that he said, if ye abide me, my word abide in you. You can ask what you may, and it'll be given to you. Believe us thou this. Either he said in the last days there come a falling away. Man to be heavy, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. I believe we're living in that day. Believe us thou this. He said in that day the branch of the Lord should be beautiful. He prophesied to have a church that these signs of follow them that believe in Mark 16. He said in my name they shall cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. They shall serve to drink dirty things, lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. I believe that we're living in that day right now. Believe us, thou, this. I believe this spirit right here this afternoon. I believe he said that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe us, thou, this. I believe that every man and woman standing here right now, under the function of the Holy Ghost, could expect Jesus right now to receive the Holy Ghost. Believe us, thou, this. I believe you're healed the person that's living right now if you're just only expecting. Do you believe us out of this? Three years ago, I used to let me in the room and said, or in the room and said, if you get the people to believe you, be sincere when you pray. Nothing shall stand before your prayer. Believe us out of this. I believe you sure now. Believe us out of this. I believe you want to heal right now. Believe us out of this. I believe you want to heal these men with cancer. Believe us out of this. I believe you want to heal a little cripple boy. Believe us out of this. I believe you want to fill the temple of the Holy Ghost right now. Believe us out of this. Let us stand and give me praise then.